Hello, and welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, and on this episode, we have a special guest for you. Jordan Baller, a research associate here at the Acton Institute, will be speaking with PJ O'Rourke, American political satirist and journalist. They'll be talking about PJ's newest book, which is called None of My Business, in which he tackles business, investment, finance, and the political chicanery behind them. You can also hear PJ speak more about this at our upcoming event here in Chicago. He'll be giving a talk on March 7th at the Peninsula Chicago, and there is still time to register. Make sure to save your seat before tickets run out and register at actin.org slash events. After that, Acton's Director of Communications, John Caritas, will be speaking with Ray Notstein, a writer and editor at Civitas Institute. They'll be talking about the movie They Shall Not Grow Old, directed by Peter Jackson. When They Shall Not Grow Old came out in theaters a few months ago, it was in a limited number of theaters and had a limited number of showings. But I'm happy to tell you that it's been released again, and it's now showing in over 1,000 theaters all over the U.S. So make sure to see it while you still can. I had the opportunity of seeing it this past holiday season, and I can tell you that you really don't want to miss it. The attention to detail that Jackson applied throughout the documentary is obvious, and it's comprised of mostly original footage from World War I. If you want to check out more on this topic, anywhere from articles to trailers, and if you also want to check out more on the first topic of conversation having to do with PJ O'Rourke and his book, you can check out all the links in our show notes, which are published on our blog every Wednesday when this episode releases. To visit our blog, go to blog.acton.org. And last but not least, we want to hear from you. Whether it's constructive criticism, a suggestion for a guest or topic, or if you just want to let us know why you like the show, you can call the Act in Line team at 888-705-4180. Or you can shoot us an email at actinline at actin.org. That's actinline at actin.org. Thanks for joining us. This is Jordan Baller of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty, and it's my pleasure to be speaking with P.J. O'Rourke today on the Acton podcast, Acton Line. P.J. O'Rourke has written 19 books on subjects as diverse as politics and cars, etiquette and economics. Two of his books, Parliament of Horrors and Give War a Chance, both reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list. He's the H.L. Mencken Research Fellow at the Cato Institute and a regular panelist on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. He's also editor-in-chief of the web magazine American Consequences. He lives in rural New England, and we're here to speak primarily about his new book, None of My Business. PJ, the the subtitle is PJ Explains Money, Banking, Debt, Equity, Assets, Liabilities, and Why He's Not Rich, and Neither Are You. PJ, it's a great pleasure to to be speaking with you today. Well, thank you, Jordan. I'm I'm, I'm glad to be here. You know, one of the things... uh, that I really enjoy. I really, first of all, let me say I really enjoyed the book. And one of the things that I, I enjoyed about reading it is uh, having a little bit of familiar, familiarity with your perhaps not quite dulcet tones from listening to you on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. I could hear you speaking to me as I read this book. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be talking to you about it. Um, I've got a few questions and, and some things, uh, especially of interest, I think, to our audience here at the Acton Institute where we speak about economics and morality and faith in the free society. One is, um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is this idea that this term mutant capitalism, mutant capitalism, you say that uh, capitalism has transitioned in some ways from what it used to be. Could you talk a little bit about what you mean by that term and what's, what the typology of capitalism that you have in mind, perhaps? Sure. I mean, let's, let's walk back just a little bit um, uh, to capitalism itself, uh, a term that gets thrown around in some really odd ways. I mean, capitalism is just a, a fact of economics. Uh, if you take the capital C off it, and small capitalism, uh, capitalism is simply the accumulation of goods and, indeed, skills and talents the accumulation of what uh, of whatever is needed to um, to pursue a project of any kind. I mean, if you're going to build a road, you have to accumulate concrete and gravel, stones, dirt, workers, and uh, and you have to have the the the, the means to, to to purchase these or the power to to requisition them. So every enterprise, uh, however slight, 
requires a, a capital accumulation. And this is every bit as true in a communist country, a socialist country, a socialist democracy, a free market economy. So, uh, you know, the first thing people should understand about capitalism is it, it, it's simply a fact of any kind of any kind of physical enterprise in the world. And, you, and metaphorically, you could extend that to any kind of intellectual uh, enterprise. You've got to accumulate a certain amount of knowledge before, or you're supposed to, uh, before you hold forth on a subject and so on. So, so capital is just the uh, the means of getting things done. Now, when we talk about capitalism, uh, that's often used as a uh, as a as, as a, a synonym for uh, the free market economy. Um, and what I'm specifically talking about with mutant capitalism is the way uh, uh, corporations uh, are behaving today and how that is or isn't similar uh, to the way they behaved in my formative years in, say, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and so on. And um, I, I remain mystified by these corporations that have a huge market valuation, that is to say that if you, you add up the value of all the stock that they've got out there, it's gazillions of dollars. It's, it's one of those astronomy numbers. It's a Carl Sagan number. <laughs> and yet they don't return any profits or very modest profits. Well, what, what, what's going on there? You know, and then you, you, then, you know, you can hardly a day goes by you don't know, read about something, you know, somebody created some app. Usually they're about 19 years old. The app is for something I don't understand at all. And some other mutant capitalism company just bought that app for uh, a number that would, um, uh, yeah. You know, Boggle the mind. Carl yeah. Sagan. Right. So I, I, you know, I sort of, I sort of don't, I think uh, my, my analysis of this is that, that when a new new technology comes along, and we must remember that the whole digital world, the whole internet thing, is, as human endeavors go, very, very recent. When a new technology comes along, I think there, the, it, 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 when it's so new that it seems like magic, I think people start to engage in magical thinking about it. Uh, you know, when steam was uh, harnessed, people always, obviously always knew about steam, but when the steam was harnessed for steam engines, there were all sorts of inventions for steam-powered fountain pens, you know, right. <laughs> you know steam-powered shoes. Uh, when electricity was, was, was discovered and harnessed, it was thought to cure arthritis, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And I think we're going through that same period with the Internet here. So it's a it's a bit natural then to try to experiment a little bit with something that's new, um, perhaps find new ways of using it that nobody had ever thought of because they never thought of using this thing for this other thing in the first place, and some of the, you know most of those discoveries are not going to amount to anything or they're not even going to be discoveries. Yeah, that's the important thing for somebody who's actually an investor to always keep in mind is that uh, it's great people are out trying all these things. Um, but uh you know if you were to go back to the be say the beginning of of um of the uh, uh of social media you probably would have put all your money in myspace <laughs> right <laughs> i always say about myspace i finally figured out how myspace worked and then i discovered i was the only person in there <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is amazing to think about these these firms or these um these products, I guess, these platforms that seem like, from one perspective, they've been around forever. But then when you take a step back and look, oh, no, actually, it was only founded in 2007 or something like that. And it seems like there's, you know, there's before and after YouTube. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And the idea that uh, that uh, that uh, um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is the one that particularly tickles me, the idea that he's like the third wealthiest man on the planet or something, according to what the stock market did today, uh, and that basically um, um, he, he invented a way to meet, meet girls. <laughs> right. So we're living in an age of many transitions, and the transitions that are coming are, are coming faster, and they seem to be at least potentially fundamental in some serious ways. One of those has to do with money. You've got some great, you know, that's the first list of, that's the first term that you have in your long list of things that you're going to talk about in the book, in the subtitle. It struck me to, to go back a little bit. I, I, uh, one of the definitions of money that's in Ambrose Bierce's 
Devil's Dictionary is that it's a, a blessing that is of no advantage to us, excepting when we part with it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of the, of the Devil's Dictionary, and I had forgotten that one. That's that's. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll swipe that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, I was going to ask, I mean, you've got a lot of things to say about currency and money in general, but also especially about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. You know, if there was going to be a devil's dictionary entry for something like crypto, what what are some of the things that would be in there? What are some of the things that um, are promised and then you're a little bit more skeptical about being actually be able to be delivered? Yeah, I mean, because theoretically, this is a great idea. I mean, money is one of the fundamental. It's one of those things. If you think about it too hard, your head will explode. I mean, the uh, uh, money is, is fundamental to all modern economies. And and yet, it's an extremely hard thing to understand because there are various different types of money. I mean, there's there 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 there's uh, um, a commodity money, gold, for instance, that is based upon the the the, the worth of this commodity. It could be anything. It could be aluminum or steel or whatever. And yet, of course, we all know the price of commodities fluctuates wildly. Um, then there uh, it is a sort of promissory note, fiduciary money, it's called, which is a a promise to pay a certain amount of a commodity in return for this piece of paper. That's what we had when we were on the gold standard. Um, uh, it used to be pretty much in the 19th century, it was pretty much universal. Um, uh, th- then we have the, the modern phenomenon, what all, all major currencies now are fiat currencies. And a dollar is worth a dollar basically because the U.S. Treasury and, uh, and, and, uh, and the Federal Reserve Bank say that a dollar is worth a dollar. And if you start thinking about this, a dollar is worth a dollar worth of what? Well, if you take a dollar bill to the treasury, they'll give you, you know, they'll give you 10 dimes, they'll give you 20 nickels, <laughs> right. they'll give you 100 pennies. Right. <laughs> a dollar is worth a dollar. Um, and if it weren't for the fact that we have a free market and we can trade our dollars for Mexican pesos or Canadian dollars or or, um, um, or, 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 or euros or, or, or um, renminbi, um, as we see fit, uh, we, 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 we wouldn't basically be safe from, from, from government predation in the form of them simply printing as much of this stuff as they like. Which to some extent, Which maybe we're not so safe. Anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> but at least you've got a little bit of a, there's some competitiveness there, or there's a, there's an out of some kind. It's not a total monopoly. There is. As long as the right. free market exists, you can, you can, you can take that, that, that money. And if you think the, the federal government's going too crazy with the printing of the money, you can buy the Krugerrands and bury them in your yard. Probably not a great investment strategy, but right. <laughs> you, or can. you can turn it into pork bellies or you can turn it into stock or bonds or, um, so with crypto, you know, you you run into this, lots of similar kinds of issues, like defining it, thinking too hard about it, and having your head explode, or really just not understanding how it works. I mean, at least with something like Bitcoin. Well, the, the yeah. thing about crypto that that's scary is that it is so brilliant in theory, and so weird, um, so otherwise than brilliant in practice. I mean, the theory is. We, cre- we mathematically create a fixed account, uh, 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 amount of, of currency units. And, and, that, and, that, and that fixed number will never vary, so that the, there will always be the... Right. And, and then we have this blockchain thing, which is basically an open, transparent accounting system where every addition, subtraction, every transfer is visible to everybody on the system. Um, and so there's, in theory, there's absolutely no room for cheating. Um, but then in practice, this stuff is made up in your head. Right. <laughs> They're long strings of numbers. <laughs> They're long strings of you numbers. You know, for a, for a long time, uh, the way you got Bitcoin, right, was to buy a, a, a fistful of graphics cards and run them at high temperatures and hope you got enough back to be able to pay for your high electricity bills, which of course electricity is run mostly on coal. So we're digging coal, we're bringing coal out of the earth and turning it into long strings of numbers in a very inefficient way to do what? To have this very, um, I would say speculative, you know, new alternative. I think speculative is kind. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, there's yeah. There, you theoretically can't cheat unless you are the only one with the numbers, uh, the access to the account, and you fake your own death. 
or something like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, or if you got, um, um, uh, if you were the A student in the math class instead of the D student like me. <laughs> yeah. So th- another rule of thumb that comes out and it's, it's, um, it's in your book is, you know, if you can't understand how these companies are making money, you, you ought to be a little bit wary about investing in them. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, same that's crypto, absolutely. Guess, yeah. That comes from uh, my own money manager, a, uh, a wonderful guy, um, and, um, um, and and stalwart Catholic, I may add, Michael Farr, who runs uh, Farr Miller Washington, um, and our very modest savings and college accounts and stuff are, are with Michael. And Michael is, is, told me the story was uh, um, he and I some years back were discussing Enron, and I said, so, Michael, did, did you or any of your investors did you, did you get burned with Enron? He said, nope, and, uh, and, uh, and I'll tell you why. And he, he said uh, uh, when Enron was really on a tear and was uh, uh, Fortune magazine and Forbes and so on were heralding it as one of the most innovative companies in the world, they figured out a new way to trade energy and so on and so forth, Sky, the stock is rocketing. Michael calls his analysts into his office, and he says, well, we got to look at this Enron thing. This thing's really taken off there. You know, there could be some money to be made. Will you guys go do your due diligence on Enron? Week goes by, nothing happens. Two weeks go by, nothing happens. Michael calls his analysts in on the carpet, and he said, I asked you two weeks ago, I asked you to look into this Enron thing. I said, we're still, we're still doing it. We're still working on it. Don't, you know, <laughs> uh, give us a little time here, Michael. A couple more weeks go by. Nothing from the analyst. Michael calls him in. He's furious. He says, it's a month ago. I asked you to look into Enron, and I've gotten nothing back from you. And so his like, chief analyst says, Michael, do you remember what you told us when you hired us? Michael goes, mm, no. <laughs> the chief analyst said, the first thing you have to do with a company – is figure out how they're making their money. We have spent a month digging into Enron, and we cannot figure out how they're making their money. And that's why you have not heard back from us. Michael goes, oh, (laughs) okay. And so he said, you know, keep digging. They kept kept digging. They never found anything. And and, uh, Michael and his clients were spared the indignity of Enron. Yeah. The uh, and so you never invest in that kind of an uh, investment. Yeah, Michael says he like uh, he saved a fortune through ignorance. (laughs) (laughs) So one of the things that crypto is uh, and currencies, uh, cryptocurrency, is supposed to address is the the possibility. We we alluded to it uh, in passing at least earlier. The the reality of inflation, the possibility of printing more money that governments have via their fiat currency, and one of the ways that the phenomena of inflation really comes out in your book is comparing the middle-class lifestyle of, say, 50 years ago to that of today. And that, that really hits home with me because I'm reading through your description of things and how much things cost and comparing back and forth. And, and, I, and I think to myself, well, I mean, I'm enjoying myself many of these things that you describe as, as being part of a kind of a standard middle-class lifestyle of 50 years ago. Um, you know, there are obvious differences, like the cars are, you know, more powerful or newer, or they, you know, the windows are power windows as opposed to having to roll them up and things like that. Um, but one of the biggest one for me existentially is I, me and my wife both work full time and that's what it takes to, to live this kind of lifestyle now in the suburbs outside of a, you know, a medium sized city. Yeah, for sure. And you're probably, um, uh, in the lucky category because this all, the, the research on this came as a kind of a shock to me. I was just trying to figure out, you know, everybody's complaining about the middle class life, middle class life, this, that, and, you know, disappearing middle class. And I said, is this really true, or is this just sort of a, a perception? Is the fact that there are uh, uh, seemingly wild herds of billionaires roaming the woods these days, does that just make us all feel poor? <laughs> so I went back and I tried to analyze, uh, you know, did uh, the. Um, um, uh, it, it did about as much math as I can do, which is to, 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 to use the um, inflation index, you know, the, the, the consumer price index. So in start, I knew what my dad made in the early 1950s, and I, obviously I know where we lived when I'm, say, I'm seven years old or so. And uh, I know what kind of neighborhood we lived in, what kind of house, car, all that kind of stuff. And I happened to, 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 to uh, remember what my dad my dad made 
my mom used to keep pretty good accounts on these things. So I knew he made about twelve grand a year. And I knew, and we lived in a four-bedroom house with a bath and a half on, you know, a fraction of an acre, a nice, safe, pleasant suburban neighborhood. And boy, when I compared the figures for what cost what, I found that housing was way more expensive um, than, than it had been. Uh, adjusted for inflation, it was way more expensive than it had been in the 50s. In order to find this na- neighborhood with the same sort of low crime rate, good schools, and so on, you had to go to a much fancier suburb than the one we, we lived in. That was one thing I found. Uh, come, a lot of things were cheaper. Cars were close to the same. They were a little more expensive, but the cars are... I grew up in the car business, and I can speak to this. The cars are today a lot better and a lot more reliable than they were and safer uh, than they were 60 years ago. The price of the cars hadn't varied that much. Food actually was cheaper. Um, But medical care was more expensive, but, hey, my dad died at 49. I'm, I'm 71. I'm still here, you know. So you could you could make a case at least that although medical care is much more expensive than it was in the fifties, it's also much better. Well, the two, the, but the thing that was really a knockout was was education. The inflation in 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 um, in the cost of education, especially if you factor in the likelihood that a middle class family now feels that their children should go to private secondary schools, if not prim- private primary schools, too. Right. And even in places, the I mean, the fallback position in, when I was a kid was the Catholic school system. Sure. Um, it has shrunk, and even where it, it, it still is, I mean, where we live, it would be an uh, hour and a half commute to the Catholic high school. To the closest one. Wow, okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the the Catholic grade school in the next town over from us closed down. Yeah, I graduated in the '90s, and I remember outside of Detroit, and um, a lot of the high school. Well, I think all the high schools in the city, but a lot of the high schools that were even in the suburbs, you know, no longer exist now. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I grew up in uh, just around the corner in Toledo. So same same situation. A uh, high school I went to is closed. The high school that my that serves the neighborhood that I grew up in is not one you'd want to send your kid to. You know, but what was the biggest biggest change and the saddest change between middle class life is has to do with the divorce rate. I say you take this much more expensive. It's much more expensive to be in the middle class adjusted for inflation than it was in the 1950s, but the biggest problem is so many people have two families now. Family they left behind, another family that they started. So I said, take my figures, which are in of themselves, like not very happy making, and double them. It's a Yeah, that's a huge and underappreciated social trend that has all these kinds of economic consequences downstream. Yes, 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 especially the economic uh, 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 consequences of... Uh, of uh, uh, that's like Charles Murray and losing ground and his discussion of you know poverty and welfare in the United States says that uh, you know uh, rule one is get married and stay married. Well, PJ, it's been great talking to you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us. I've I've got one final question. Um, sure. Are you are you more satisfied when when you look at a, a chicken coop that's been cleaned out? You know, you talk about doing that a couple times a year, and you and you see that. That, uh, that clean coop, um, or which probably happens almost just as often, you get your latest book in the mail for the first time and see it in print. Which one of those makes you more Chicken satisfied? Coop. <laughs> <Okay>. Chicken coop. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially after I've showered. Sure. <laughs> it is a dirty job. But it's, you know, by the time you get done with a book, you are so sick of the thing. Right, <laughs> you know? right. If you ever see it again, you know, anybody even mentions the title, you cringe. That's of course just when they put you out on book tour. Uh, when That's you have when to the real talk work about starts. the book that you yeah, wrote, you know. Sure. And I, now it's been long enough. You know, I'm 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 past my. Uh, you know, the book came out last fall, so I'm past my post-traumatic stress disorder <laughs> period. 
and I'm glad to talk about it now. In fact, it'd probably be hard to shut me up. But uh, in the immediate aftermath of finishing the book, there's about three months there where you have a uh, postpartum depression. Well, PJ, thanks so much, and thanks for soldiering on through. Um, we're looking forward to, to having you uh, in Chicago in March, and uh, thanks very much. It will be fun. Join us in Grand Rapids to explore theology, philosophy, business, development, and market-based economics at the most unique conference in the Liberty Movement. During Acton University, the annual four-day conference of the Acton Institute, you'll get to choose from over 100 courses and over 60 speakers and connect with more than 1,000 people from all over the world. Come build the foundations of freedom with us and apply today at university.acton.org. That's university.acton, A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. Welcome, I'm your host, John Caritas, and today we're talking about Peter Jackson's new documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old. It's a documentary based on actual World War I footage shot by news photographers over 100 years ago. Jackson, who's best known uh, as director of the Lord of the Rings series, The Hobbit, uh, engaged with the Imperial War Museum in the United Kingdom to produce this documentary to mark the centenary of the armistice of World War I. It was released in December in a limited uh, run at some theaters, and now it's set to roll out to something like 500 screens in 150 markets. My guest today is Ray Notstein, who is uh, editor at Civitas Institute in Raleigh, North Carolina. Ray uh, is also, uh, some of you may know, was uh, a former managing editor of Religion and Liberty here at Acton. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Ray. Glad to be here and looking forward to talking about this film. You know, I really can't recommend this film highly enough. What I was struck by was the use of this advanced technology that Jackson and his crew uh, brought to bear on this original footage and how it brought out the humanity of these soldiers in the trenches. You see their faces, you hear their words, you get a real sense that you were there with them. It's a documentary that really was an homage to these soldiers. It wasn't politicized, it didn't have any ideological angle, and it was something that uh, Jackson engaged in as a labor of love. His grandfather, I believe, served in World War One. What struck you, Ray, about this film? I think that's exactly right. The way he elevated the human aspect of this, the folks that served in the trenches, so many soldiers on, on both sides, and, and, and just the horrific nature that was trench warfare. Anytime we think of trench warfare, of course, we, we think of World War I. So I think just the way that he elevated the human uh, soldier, particularly the British, because it's from their point of view primarily, and what they dealt with in World War One. I. I mean, you had mass casualties uh, at battles like the Somme. You had over, just, I'm not talking about the Commonwealth countries, but just in Britain alone, you had 700-something thousand uh, British soldiers die in the war. And how we really brought that out, because we've lost some of that history. And a lot of the World War One veterans were overshadowed by the Second World War. And uh, he even alludes to that, or, you know, you have the voice of, of, of the veterans that say, we kind of got uh, forgot about after we came back from the war, even though so many died, um, I think the, the death rate of a, a British soldier in the war was about 12 and a half percent. So obviously a lot of them survived. And so what I just found really unique is that he let them speak through their own voices instead of having, you know, talking heads on the, on the um, program or just having historians in there interpreting what happened. And the film is actually in two parts. So I'm guessing it's about an hour and a half. The last half hour is a mini documentary on how they actually pulled off this incredible uh, technical feat of restoring this footage. Things like the frame rate being restored, the colorization. They actually hired actors to put words in the mouths of these soldiers that were in these original films uh, by using forensic lip readers, uh, lip readers that would work for the police, and on and on. And it really vivified what was an old sort of herky-jerky black and white films, which were, uh, you know, undoubtedly of interest in themselves, but 
this really put color and life into it. The approach in, in interviews, Jackson would say that when he was engaged in this project by the Imperial War Museum, he asked them, well, what exactly are you looking for? And they said, I don't know. You figure that out. Uh, just give us something fresh and new. And so what he did was he let the soldiers speak for themselves. As you said, they didn't have like, they didn't cut away to experts in an armchair telling you what really happened. Uh, There wasn't a narrator voice coaching you as it went. It really was the words of the soldiers. And in fact, sometimes they would, uh, in one remarkable scene, they found a a telegram that an officer read to some soldiers they actually found a footage of this officer reading to the soldiers, and they put those things together. And one thing I'd, I'm, I'm wondering if you, you were struck by the fact that the soldiers themselves had great camaraderie. They even had fun at times. They did not view themselves as cannon fodder or victims. They viewed themselves as willingly and in some cases enthusiastically serving their country in the war. Although, as the, of course, as the war wore on, there was a, quite a bit of disillusionment. What was your take on that? I think that's a great point, John. Um, that's overshadowed a lot now in our understanding of World War I because, you know, there's been so many books, whether it's uh, Paul Fussell, um, The Great War in Modern Memory, or other books, um, The Guns of August. We get this sort of disillusionment that all the soldiers were disillusioned with what they were experiencing that, uh, you know, the trench poets, anytime you think of trench poets, uh, you automatically think of World War One too. I mean, that's a, a term synonymous with World War One. And, of course, they wrote a lot of uh, dedication to the dead, and sometimes there's a lot of cannon fodder-type symbolism in their work. But uh, the common soldier, so many of them, were very proud of their service. And, you know, in this film, they talk about, oh, I'd go do it again, and it was some of the funnest time of my life. And, uh, you know, besides the few times we had to go over the top, that uh, it was, you know, they almost described it as just having a ball and that camaraderie was evident. And I think that's an important point because there's just so much uh, literature out there. There's a great book that sits on my um, bookshelf at home. It's called The Price of Pity, and it's written by an English historian. And I think, uh, you know, you see a lot of conservative themes in his work, but his name's Martin Stephen. And he talks about some of the myths that have sort of... Um, overlaid World War One and how we understand it today because of the trench poets, because of a lot of the literature. There's books like Testament of Youth that are very pacifistic uh, in nature, and there's a lot of pacifism that grows out of World War One. But it, it, it sort of neglects that the soldier and what they experienced and that, uh, you know, that they were very proud of their service. And a lot of them, you know, like you mentioned, the, sort of the cannon fodder, that the officers let them down or the generals let them down. A lot of them admired uh, the men that led them. We were very close to them. And um, I think another thing just to just touch upon about this film that I think is really valuable, even though the footage is a hundred a little over a hundred years old, we're really still really connected to world war one in, in terms of what has changed in Europe. We saw with all these celebrations and ceremonies, how defining uh, world war one was for Europe when they came together to remember all of these that were sacrificed in this war. But um, it's, we are very close to this because I remember when I worked for a congressman in Mississippi, we called over to the veterans home. This is around the turn of the century, 2000, 2001, just that when I had gotten out of college. And I remember talking to two World War I veterans on speakerphone. And my boss and I would call over there and we would just uh, talk to them. It was, it was kind of this eerie thing because I almost felt like these guys were hidden away. There was only a few of them left and they, you know, this is around the time when World War II veterans started making the news more because more of them were dying every week, and there were still a couple of World War I veterans The there. greatest so it was, generation, it was, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was very haunting and eerie that there were still a few World War I veterans uh, left, but we're still very connected to them. So still within living memory, you had a connection to these men who fought in World War I, and you had a chance to connect with them very late in their lives. Yeah, I mean, they were obviously in their late 90s, maybe even over 100. And I, I think um, that's one of the reasons that Jackson, Peter Jackson said he wanted to make this film was because we're losing some of this uh, connection and the story that they, they lived through. And like I said before, so many of them were overshadowed by World War II. I mean, there's not even a, I don't think, uh, there's, there's not a World War I monument on the mall in Washington for these guys. And 
we've sort of overshadowed them with, with World War II, and you know, understandably so to some degree, but we're losing some of that story aspect because the people that knew them are, are, are dead or dying too now. Yeah, and I think a great deal of the authenticity and the reality that comes through in this work is that Jackson used, as is widely known, 100 hours of uh, real footage from World War I. But then he also went through 600 hours of uh, video interviews that the BBC did in the 60s uh, with World War I vets. And so he was able to put these two sources together um, to let these veterans speak about their experience in their own voices. And, the, I mean, the effect is, is, is pretty amazing. I, I, really thought, I really think that anyone's interested in the history of World War I or the actual battlefield experience of these soldiers really should get out and see this movie now that it goes into wider release. Uh, you saw this in December, correct? I saw this in uh, early January, I believe I can't. Remember. I think it was in January. It was after the Christmas break. Did you? What? Anything surprise you about this film uh, in particular as you were sitting there watching it unfold? Well, I was just impressed. Like you mentioned, is the way that he was able to uh, mimic or or really add to the sound effect nature of, of the film. With uh, you know, he brought in actors from the same regions that these uh, people, you units were from. So he was able to echo not just the voice, but the dialect that they probably would have had. He was able to echo just uh, very, you know, the sounds as, as a cannon fire or cannons rolling or mud or, or feet kind of clamping or chopping through the mud, which was, you know, it took a lot of work. So there's a lot of attention to detail in this film that I think you'll definitely pick up when you watch it in, in, in the way that he, spent a lot of time going through and adding these various sound effects. And I thought the soundtrack too was particularly uh, powerful. I mean, you have that, uh, that, uh, that um, notable tune from the end, but also just out, he's very uh, subtle in the way he uses sound and just a little bit of music to, I think, heighten the awareness of what's happening, happening on the battlefield. It's all very subtle and I think powerfully done because the attention is rightfully placed on the men, what they were going through, and um, you know how they felt about the war and, and what experience they went through. And I think that's uh, just powerful to do because I think people need to have be in touch with their past and be in touch with the you know the, the past that their family may have gone through because we're going through similar things today in terms of just great conflict and and, and great division. And I think it's important to recognize. Um, you know, we're not dealing with anything new, to, so to speak, and but we need to be aware so we can pre- prevent these kind of things too, as well. Absolutely. We're talking today about They Shall Not Grow Old, the new documentary from Peter Jackson, who, by the way, declined to be paid for this effort. He did this uh, because he himself had family who served in the war, and he himself had an intense interest in, in the history of World War I. Uh, as a New Zealander, His country also sent many men to serve in this conflict. Ray, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for listening today. If you want to learn more about the Acton Institute and what we do, visit our website at acton.org. That's A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. Please do not forget to share this episode with any friends and family you think would enjoy listening. Word of mouth is usually the primary source of growth for any podcast. Lastly, we want to hear from you, whether it's constructive criticism, a suggestion for a specific guest or topic, or if you just want to let us know that you like this podcast, we would love to hear from you. Leave us a message at 888-705-4180 or shoot us an email at actonline at actin.org.